Join us for a journey as we go back to the great civilizations of the past. Who were the people? What were they like? How did they begin and how did they end? Let's find out on episode 36, Being a Woman in Sparta. Previously, on the Fan of History, in 1801 BC or thereabouts, chaos was made into order in the land of Laconia in Greece. From this rose the city-state of much prominence, Sparta, city of warriors. This is the last of the three-part series about Sparta. This time we'll talk about being a woman in archaic Sparta. Dan. Hi there. Hey, how is it that we have come to this part and now it is time to talk about being a woman in Sparta? It's been quite yes. a journey. That's quite a journey. <laughs> and this subject is by far uh, the most popular video on our YouTube channel, Fan of History on YouTube. You should be subscribing to that. Please subscribe to that. <laughs> Yes. I hope you like this episode as much as people seem to like the, the YouTube episode. Because uh, this is an interesting subject, and it's mainly because Sparta has the reputation for being the best place to be a woman in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. And we will examine that statement in depth and see if that is really the case. But before we dive in, we're going to ask Brennan what he thinks about... Hey. Spartan women, and he will then represent uh, a typical person. What do you think about Spartan women? Well, um, it's kind of interesting. You know, you have this impression of Spartan men as, you know, basically the the, the prototypical warrior. And then we learned a lot about that last time. But for women, it's kind of hard to tell. I mean, a lot of movies don't talk about it except for 300 it seemed that I'm just trying to think about it. it. It didn't seem like they had, I don't know. They didn't have much say in things, but it's almost, but they did seem to fully support their men, you know, as a, uh, as a, not, you know, kind of like a, uh, they'll, they'll keep the home front running while they're, you know, the men are off at war. Um, they seemed very, very understanding, like it was their duty to understand and be understanding of these this their men's lifestyle. You know what I mean? I don't know. That's kind of the way I, I picture it. Yeah. So, so the general impression is that Spartan women are Cersei. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> Lena Headey. No, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I see some similarities to Viking women actually, because oh. if you are. If you're a woman that stays at home when your man is always out fighting, it actually creates a lot of power for the women mm -hmm. because the men are not around to run things, so right. someone else has to do it. Anything else you think about when you think about Spartan women? Um, that's all I can. That's all I can kind of. That's my general impression right now. All right. What we will be looking at here, then, will be life as a Spartan free woman, because mm -hmm. I think that's what we are all thinking about. Right. But also the life of a Helot woman, the special kind of Spartan slaves. We will also talk about the weird practice of Spartan wife sharing. And we will talk about Spartan heterosexuality. And the absence of Spartan homosexuality. Right. So a bit about the Spartan sex life. Uh, remember, the overall goal of anyone in Sparta should be to serve the Spartan state. Mm -hmm. Everything in Sparta is, the state is everything. And the Spartan right. way of life. And if you do not conform to this, you have to die or be exiled. And this applies as much to women as it does to men. So we have three social classes in Sparta. We have the equals, the Spartan citizens. We have the people that are free but not equal. Mm -hmm. And we have the helots, the slaves. And women can never be equal. 
So they are barred from the highest class. And that's a pretty big downside right. to be woman. But it is still exactly like everywhere else in the ancient world. So that's not special for Sparta that women, yeah. Like in Athens, even during democracy, women doesn't, women don't get votes, etc. Mm -hmm. So all non-slave women were free, but not equal. But as a woman, you were a projection of your husband's status. So if he was an equal, you were a lot higher in status than a woman who was married to a periochiae, for example. Okay. Or a foreigner. <laughs> Heaven forbid. So, the Spartan state wants you as a woman to become the mother of as many Spartan equals as possible. So your status increases as well if you can give birth to a Spartan boy who has a chance of becoming an equal. So childbirth is your sacred duty to the Spartan state. And Spartan women were famous for their fertility in Greece. So they, they really took this to heart, like, I must have many Spartans. Wow, so, so in general, they, they tended to have more children, or yes. that they were just capable overall of having more children? Uh, both. Both? So, wow. Uh, and this duty then was the big thing. So w when you had three boys, for example, you were like, <laughs> look at me. I, I gave birth to these three magnificent boys who can become Spartan equals. All right. Uh, the Spartan culture also has all this uh, focus on physical fitness. And this applies to the girls as well. While they, the girls are not going through the agogi, okay. uh, they don't have to leave their family, etc. But they will still compete a lot and be very physically fit. And they are known for this all across Greece. And they are also known for their liberty. The other Greeks think that the Spartans are just letting their women run loose. <laughs> oh, didn't and the Greeks... it's very scary. Right. Didn't the Greeks make their... Like, once the woman got married, they had to stay in the house or the... On the family yes, in land? Athens, it's basically that you... Uh, you can never, never leave the house alone at no point in your life. Maybe when you're a widow. Right. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so the Spartan women... Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay. Yeah. We, we look at the life cycle of a Spartan woman. Uh, as I said last time, Sparta never uh, writes down its history or its practices. They don't feel that they need to explain themselves in writing, which leaves us somewhat in the dark. So all our reports come from other people writing about the Spartans, and especially then the Athenians, who at many points are not very happy with the Spartans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at the life of a Spartan woman. After she's born, she is not exposed. Uh, so this, the Spartan girls are not... Uh, <laughs> yeah, no babies were thrown off cliffs. <laughs> okay. But the Spartan girls don't go through this uh, rigorous... Uh, uh, they, they, don't, they are not examined and not killed. I gotcha in the way that the boys are. I think if you're extremely deformed at birth, you, you probably will be anyway, but it's not the high numbers of the men. The, the general Spartan problem is always the lack of equals, that the number of Spartan equals is so low. A typical number would be like 5,000 equals, and that's the whole of the Spartan wow. central power. And you have so many helot slaves. And that's uh, maybe a typical number for helot slaves are 35,000. So uh, the, the risk of a slave rebellion is always there, as we talked about last time. Okay, back to the girl. Okay. She is now growing up, and this is not well documented at all, but we know there's a lot of physical training, there's a lot of physical games. There seems to be a lot of stuff you learn as a girl when you grow up such as arts, music, dancing, and poetry. Hmm. Okay. But this, this is not written down either, so <laughs> very little of this is preserved. But it seems to be a very strong focus on 
culture in Sparta. Yeah, that's that that surprises me a lot. They don't write down their history yet. They think poetry is important. Yes. And a Spartan dancing and music is a legendary in quality in Greece. Wow. And even though they don't write down uh, documentation about what they're doing, some women actually learn to read and write, which is extremely rare in the whole world. I was about to say, that seems... That's incredible. And I'm sure this is all pretty strict, if you compare it to today. But you oh, can't yeah, break the rules, much. but it's extremely lenient compared to the agogi. So the girls are treated much better uh, during their youth than the boys are. Then we have uh, we have a lot of Spartan festivals. And I like to mention the weird Gymnopedia. Okay. Spartan <laughs> festival of naked youth. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Huh. All but, right. Uh, d- did I tell the Olympic story last time? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, th- this story is so good about Spartan Wins. I-, I-, I imagine I will tell it more than once. You have to stop me then. Yeah, <laughs> okay. We haven't talked about the Olympics yet. We will do a whole episode about the Olympics when they start in 776 BC. Sounds but good. As Spartan women were so fit and had all this time training, they and they competed often with uh, with men even in Sparta, so they felt that oh we are pretty good at uh, at sports, and then the Olympic starts and the Spartan girls are like hey we could compete there against uh, like <laughs> people from Corinth and stuff they don't stand a chance, but there are some very strict rules at the Olympics about women, but at some point some Spartan women just go to the Olympics and uh, compete. So there's a, a famous incident where some other Greek comes up to the Spartan men at the Olympics mm-hmm. and says, this is outrageous. Why are those girls competing in the Olympics? And the Spartans just go, well, who is going to stop them? Are you <laughs> going to stop them? <laughs> and, and the guy goes like, um, um, I guess it's okay. Right. <laughs> Back to the life of uh, Spartan girls. When you become an adult then, and I'm not exactly sure what age that is, okay. but they don't marry as early as, for example, the Romans later. It's probably much later, even, even go into their 20s. Late teen, early 20s for marriage, which is very late in the ancient world. I was about to say, that's... I, I can see why this is getting the reputation of being the best place to be a woman in the ancient world. Well, let's see if you have that impression when we're done. Okay. (laughs) So, Spartan women can own property. They can inherit from their fathers and husbands. All right. Uh, They do have a lot of say in the household because the men are away fighting. Because remember, especially the equals, they care only about battle. They care only about being ready for when they need to fight for Sparta. So, they don't care a lot about uh, uh, being... uh, They don't care a lot about running the household because they know they have to be equal. They can't become wealthy. Mm-hmm. And given that women can, there could occasionally be rich women in Sparta, whereas a man could never be rich. Hmm. Uh, Spartan women dress very simply. It's, um, they're not allowed to become too fancy in their dress. And they have notoriously short dresses. Or, yeah, their, their legs are often not covered. And this is outrageous to other Greeks, but it's very impractical to cover your legs uh, when uh, you, have, you do sports. So, oh, yeah. So many foreigners remarked that Spartan women's legs were constantly spread because they had to have all these babies and they walk around not properly dressed. <laughs> How lascivious. And then it, there is this uh, fantastic statement that Remember having long hair as oh, yeah. a sign of being a great warrior. Yes. Of being a Spartan equal. So women are not allowed to grow their hair long. Huh. I guess that kind of makes sense. Otherwise it wouldn't be as unique. 
And also then, you are you are often at home, you're running the household, but you're not required as a Spartan free woman to do, especially if you're married to an equal, you don't have to do domestic duties like cleaning or weaving and stuff because you have the helot slaves to do that. Hmm. So you're you're more of a manager of the household. Right. Spartan women were allowed to divorce their men. And they kept their property if they did that. And they were wow. not forced to remarry, which see, almost seems strange, as you have this focus on having all these babies. But you were definitely, definitely encouraged to remarry. Ah, uh, okay. And as long as you are not married, you often stay, uh, before your first marriage, you stay with your mother. And in your home then, the, the boys leave at seven, but the girls remain maybe into their twenties. So they have often closer, very closer, much closer relationships to the mothers. Mm -hmm. And if there is a divorce then, the girls go with their mother, and uh, nobody cares about the boys because they are already gone into a diagogy. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I guess small boys then below seven will stay with their mother as well. I see. So then, yeah. were you going to say something? Oh no, I was just saying, yeah, that, that makes sense, what you're saying. So no divorce procedures, so everything is regulated. So if you then are a mother, that's a, a great honor, especially if you have sons, you really want sons. And you really care about your son's career. So if your son becomes a great warrior and becomes an equal and other, other Spartan warriors respect him, the, this honor is yours as well. And the other warriors will like, oh, you, you gave birth to a great warrior. They will give you respect for that as well. Uh, this means also, uh, oh, there we have, of course, the famous saying of the Spartan mother. You've probably heard that. When the son is going out to war. Oh, yes. His, yeah, his mother will <laughs> tell him, come home with your shield or up on it. Yep. Either win or die. <laughs> yes. If you, because if you come home without your shield, you've probably thrown it away to be able to run faster to get away from the enemy. Yeah. And your mother will not be happy with you. This whole society means then that most people in Sparta are women at any given point because the men are away fighting them. When you die, you are allowed to have a gravestone just like the, the men who died in battle if you die in childbirth. Okay. And that's the only way you can get a gravestone if you're a woman. Because you died trying to give birth to Spartan. So that's the ultimate sacrifice for the Spartan state and you will be honored forever. Hmm, makes sense. And then we have the Helot women. They are treated as other Helots. Their children will become Helot slaves. Okay. But I have looked and I have not found, and I'm very unsure about this, I could be wrong. But it seems that the Helot women never, or never is a strong word, but very, very rarely have children with the equals. So Spartan men do not rape their Helot slaves and have children with them. Because this is not proper, the, the child is not a Spartan. So if the man feels that he can have a child, he should do it with his wife. Wife, so it becomes proper Spartan, and uh, and the Helots have their rights. So I I, right. I think that is the case at least that you cannot treat your slaves as perhaps many other slave societies have done. But this leaves still open the question if there are normal chattel slaves and not Helot slaves bound to the land in Sparta or not. And I still haven't been able to find out if there are. But if there are, there are very few. Okay, we then get to Spartan wife sharing. And this is very, very, very interesting practice. 
because you you have this small number of Spartan equals, and you need to yeah. know that the Spartan men that enter the Agogi has to be as strong as possible. And there is a feeling in Spartan if you're old, you if you're old as a man, yeah, you will not have strong children. You should have your children when you are at your strongest. So if you're then an older man with power, maybe you are in the Gerosia even, in the Council of Elders. You, you could probably attract a hot Spartan girl. <laughs> but it's not fitting to impregnate her. So what you do is that you get another guy, another Spartan to impregnate your wife. Wow. So you're saying, you know, I'm kind of old. What you what I really want are some super fit children. So I'm going to go get this dude over here. Yes, exactly. And it could be initiated by either of the three parties. So it could be you saying that, oh, my dear, I brought uh, this warrior <laughs> who will now <laughs> impregnate you. Or an unmarried or childless man who was very physically fit could, like, request that uh, I should impregnate your wife for the good of Sparta. Or the wife could say, I, I need a fit, young, strong warrior to impregnate me. Wow. And especially if this woman has already born a strong son. Right. A very promising child, and then... Oh, yeah. Fit warriors will like queue up and say, "Oh, she needs to be impregnated again, <laughs> not by you, you old guy." <laughs> right. And other Greeks go nuts about this, and it could be an invention by other Greeks. And when I say other Greeks, I mostly mean Athenians because they are the number one source for bad press about Sparta. <laughs> So you're thinking that they might have made this part up, the Athenians? They could have, because the Spartans never tell us much. Oh, I guess that's true. They don't write it down, so... So this could just be uh, bad propaganda, but it kind of fits into the Spartan model. It does. It makes overall sense. And this leads into then Spartan sexuality. Okay. Of course, when you think about the ancient Greeks, you have all these homosexual and almost pederastic, if that's the right word, relationships between men, mature men and young boys and stuff. Mm -hmm. But Sparta wants to produce warriors, and homosexual relationships between men do not produce warriors. <laughs> no, it, it, that would be impossible. And this is highly contested by the Greeks because there are other Greeks that work on the hypothesis that the, the strongest warrior ever is a, a man who is in love with another man and fights at his side. So a, a homosexual pair of lovers is the best kind of warrior you can get. This, uh, this occurs at several times in Greek history. And when Sparta is finally defeated, now we are like 500 years, they okay. are uh, the sacred band of Thebes, which consists of 150 couples of gay men, are the engine of the defeat. <laughs> huh. But Spartans are homophobes. Right. Homosexuality is outlawed, probably, in Sparta. And heterosexuality is really good. Because <laughs> if you start like being in love with guys, so you are wasting your time. You should be producing children right. for Sparta. They're what like, are you that's, doing? Like, Look at that's the not where that goes. goes. <laughs> you are, they will probably think if they don't kill you, they will exile you. All right. Oh, that makes sense. I couldn't imagine someone who's gone through the, the Agoge and been a a celebrated warrior would just be murdered on the spot. I, I would no, figure probably not, exile. but uh, they, they probably have, like, ways to make them heterosexual. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure that worked really well for them. <laughs> because I really find that a common rumor about Spartans are that they are homosexual and pederast like the rest of the Greek. Like a lot of people in the rest of Greece at this time. Yeah. But 
uh, they are very much not. So let we then have to look a little at female homosexuality. And this is slightly before Sappho. Sappho is the Greek poet uh, from the island of Lesbos, from which mm -hmm. we get the word lesbian, etc. Right. And the Spartan attitude to female homosexuality is exactly the same as the rest of the ancient world. That, well, there is no penetration happening, so it's not sex. So female homosexuality doesn't exist. They're just being friends. Oh, I see. <laughs> so gotcha. no, no matter what you do, like yeah. the Spartans will not care. <laughs> They're like, oh, that's cute. Because <laughs> no, no, yeah, that's like an uh, ancient sex overall. We'll, we'll probably talk more about this when we talk about Romans because it's a lot more documented. Okay. But it's all about penetration <laughs> and power. And female homosexual relationships just doesn't fit into that model. So, it just doesn't exist. It's just ignored. Okay, so because it doesn't fit their definition, it's clearly not the case. <laughs> yeah, you say, you're close with your girlfriend, that's very nice. <laughs> right. So, Sappho, I think she probably dies around 570 BC, so she is way into the future at this point where we are now. Oh, I gotcha. Mm hmm. But she will give us uh, words and describe this uh, this thing like nobody has before. And I think that's all we have to say about being a Spartan woman. So let's get back to the question then. Do you think this was a good place to be a woman? Huh. I guess it's if you can... I would say, wow, I think it'd be really personality dependent. Uh, yes. So, if you can, if you don't have a problem towing the party line and trying to have as many kids as, as possible, or as many strong kids as possible, then it's probably not that bad. You, you can, you have, you have more, uh, I don't know, seem to have a decent amount of power. Yeah. Not as much as the men, apparently, but still, quite a bit. For ancient times, it seems quite... It's weird, because I feel like it's progressive and not progressive all at the same time. But It definitely is. So, ah, wow. I have a hard time with this. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely... I'm not a woman, so I, I can't answer that. But I, I would, based on just these assumptions, it seems like... Probably, if you had to pick, let's say if we're talking about, you know, being in Assyria or being in Athens or being um, on oh, some of the other places we've talked about. Huh. Wow. Well, it, it's, it's probably the case that it sucks to be a woman in the ancient world. Right. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> the, bar, still the bar is already set real low. <laughs> yes, because you're still part of this patriarchal society where men decide everything that matters. Oh, yeah. I don't... But I don't... if you are going to be one... True. Sparta is probably not a bad place to be. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to go with with yes. That this, we haven't this is an talked okay a lot. Mm-hmm. We haven't talked a lot about being a woman in Assyria. I guess that's true. We really haven't. We've only kind of hinted about a few things, mostly in the fact of people being the mother of somebody or wife of somebody. Yes, and the main reason we haven't talked about being a woman anywhere else is that we haven't done, we haven't looked at the society in this depth before. Uh, but we've we talked a lot about Assyria, so I should mention that uh, the reason we haven't done this for Assyria yet is that we don't have the sources for it before um, around the beginning of the 7th century BC. But we will do a similar... If we get to do the 7th century BC, we'll do a similar look into Assyrian society because it's at the end of the Assyrian Empire we have sources for how, what life is like in the Assyrian Empire. We tend to forget that the Assyrians are 
warriors and merchants and how how mercantile their society really are will show very clearly mm -hmm. when we look at daily life and what happens in your life if you are an Assyrian man or woman. But that's for later episodes. All right. Well, I guess that's going to be it for this week. Please check out our other podcasts as well. I, with along with Dan, do a Magic the Gathering podcast at Magic Gathering Strat. Um, Dan, you have another... You have two other podcasts that I know of. Uh, yes, three, maybe even. Uh, no? How many podcasts do I have? <laughs> you have a bunch. You have your Ice Falcon. I'm a fan of history. I do Game of Thrones chat. Game with... of Thrones chat, that's the one. Yes. That's another one. Uh, I do two podcasts in Swedish about the Norwegian author uh, Margit Sandemo and her Ice People novels. Uh, and I do another one in Swedish about the murder of Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme. Yes. Uh, I would like to mention one more thing about next uh, episode. Yes, Just what's happening? We're, yeah, now we're done with Sparta and we go back to the chronological narrative and we'll check in with Adad Nirari, the Assyrian king, and see what happens in the year 809 to 805 BC. Yeah, Adad Nirari. Very... Yes, he has to recover from his father's uh, very <laughs> destructive anti-Babylonian policies. Right. Going to have to figure that out. Yes. Also, don't forget, again, to go to the YouTube. There's lots of good stuff out there. Please like and subscribe. Give us a review on iTunes or any of the other um, podcast hosting sites. Um, let us know what you think, what you like, what you don't like. Because, as always, we thank you for listening, and also check us out at facebook.com slash fanofhistory. Twitter, you can do at the fan of history. On the website, there's the webpage, thefanofhistory.wordpress.com. And if you do enjoy our content, we would very much appreciate you consider supporting us at patreon.com slash fanofhistory. Please do. We are um, doing this until 701 BC and the destruction of Sennacherib. And we need to find some money to be able to do the 7th century BC. So we need $30. And the patron is at 9 right now. So please help out if you can, if you enjoy this. Then we can cover the 7th century BC, including then life in Assyria. Right. We hope we are entertaining enough for you, but also students, if you want us to do the research for you, hey, it's the best way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, definitely a part of the viewership on YouTube, is just students randomly finding fan of history. Exactly. All right, well, for this week, I am Brennan. And I'm Dan. And this has been The Fan of History. And we say goodbye to Sparta. Sparta. Oh, we does. We don't. Uh, Sparta will be back a lot. That's why we did these episodes. Right. So you can look forward to the Mycenaean War, which is not far away. Ooh, foreshadowing. Yes. <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com/slash/fanofhistory. Just a dollar an episode would help us out. Thanks, and see you next time. <laughs>